Good evening, viewers, and very warm welcome to the eighth episode of the Meet the Media Veteran series. Today, in the episode, we have a very special guest, a very renowned preservationist from USA, who has done some path-breaking work in the field of media and high-value artifacts. Before giving his full introduction to the audience, may I first welcome the renowned preservationist from USA, Mr. Milton R. Shafter, to the show. Thank you so much, Mr. Shafter, for joining us today. Glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm honored to be able to share viewpoints with you and with your audience. Absolute honor having you on the show today. So, Mr. Milton R. Shafter, the president and principal of Milja and INC, is an internationally acknowledged preservationist whose company focuses on the long term preservation of movie images and recorded sound media and high intrinsic value artifacts. As director of library resources for Paramount Pictures Studios, he was responsible for the creation and supervision of the first worldwide asset protection program, which included construction of their then state of art archive on the studio lot in Hollywood. And mirror image underground preservation storage facility in the Eastern US, as well as satellite preservation storage near London, England. In addition to planning, design, and engineering, he developed computerized tracking, mobile shelving applications, fire suppression systems, security and operational protocols that all enhanced media protection and preservation. After completing his four years Paramount contract, he though he through his company contacted similar services for other Hollywood studios like Codex Preservation Walton Services and was a major consulting expert on design of the Library of Congress National Audio Visual Conservation Center called Paper VA. He also was chosen to be the archival construction consultant for New World Disney Company Studios Film Media Archive Building. In the following years, he also expanded his client base to the work on museum preservation vaults, including the Self-Realization Fellowship in Los Angeles, California, and Wisconsin Historical Society and War Veterans Facility in Madison, Wisconsin. He has consulted the companies offering media preservation services such as Iron Mountain Corporation and Pacific Vaults. Recently, he served as archival expert in the evaluation of current facilities of the National Film Archive of India in Pune. He is currently under contract as the archival expert to design National Film Archive's Archive of the Future project. As the co-author of the Academy's Academy of Motion Picture Art and Sciences iconic reports on issues of emerging digital technologies, the digital dilemma of one and two, he has spoken and presented at film festivals, workshops, and classes worldwide to both professionals and students. In addition to his academy, academy activities on their Science and Technology Council, he has been a national governor of SMPT and is a former president of Association of Moving Image Archivists, AMIA. He serves on the NFPA 40 committee, revising the codes on cellulose nitrate film. He has been honored with awards such as SMPT Archive Medal for his extended work in the preservation of media and high intrinsic value artifact, artifacts. It is such an honor, you know, having such a legend. I won't call him veteran. He's a legend, living legend, actually. So it is such an honor having Mr. Milton Chapter on this show uh, uh, to, to speak on the, you know, uh, this uh, preservation and archival solutions to the audience. Uh, Mr. Milchita, I once again welcome you to the show. So my first question to you is, you know, there is a lot of uh, uh, sort of confusion amongst, you know, young generation preservationists and archivists. They, they think, you know, preservation and archive is archive is job is same. Uh, would you kindly uh, let, let the audience know what is the difference between a preservationist and, the, and an archivist? Thank you, first of all, for the introduction. I hope we have time for the rest of the show. That was rather long, but I, I guess you needed all that information to make me a veteran, which is part of the title. Uh, so what's the difference between a preservation and an archivist? Um, a direct line, actually. The archivist would be in charge and the, the person who would manage an archive. The preservationist, on the other hand, is a person who supports and advocates and develops policies, procedures, operating criteria for long-term maintenance of what we call high intrinsic worth items. That would include the moving image media, recorded sound, 
and also museum artifacts, historical items, manuscripts, pictures, art, and sculpture. So the real difference is one is a theoretician and project manager, and the other one is an executive in charge of an actual archive. Okay. Uh, so, you know, can a person be, you know, same time preservationist and an archivist also? I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Can a person play both roles together, you know, at a time, for example, a person can be an archivist as well as a preservationist also? Is yes, uh, I, I think the, uh, the 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 term archivist is used again in the direct management of an archive, but certainly an archivist is a preservationist. And uh, oh. although I consider myself a preservationist, I don't actively run an archive today, so I'm not an archivist. <laughs> okay, okay, great. So you know, audience would like to know your your journey, you know, to the, the to this world. So uh, can you please share, you know, how did you become the preservationist? Okay, well, I'll, I'll try to make it a short story so we don't run out of time. Um, I started as a child actor. I went into theater. I was a director. And um, I do remember it as a, a personal story. I had a wonderful aunt who was like a mother to me. And when I was going to college, she said, well, what are you going to study? And I said, well, I'm really interested in television. And she said, that's terrific. Those television repairmen make so much money. Do you know what they charged me just to put a little tube in my TV set last week? So I didn't go into that with her. And later on, when I went into uh, archival work and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm a preservationist. She said, that's better. Funeral directors make much more money than television repairmen. Anyhow, <laughs> I, um, I went after the service, I, I went into uh, television uh, production and writing, uh, did some theater work. And then uh, several years ago, I was working at a television station, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And at night, I was able to go into their film library and uh, look at all the great films that I'd heard about. That's where I kind of learned to admire the work of the cinematographer, the person that uses both sides of their brain. They have the technological side where they can uh, know what uh, camera lenses to use, what filters, how the lighting goes, what grip equipment. Um, the other side of the brain, of course, is this creative vision, bringing together what the writer and the director had envisioned on paper. And uh, that's where I really became involved and loved cinema. So skipping ahead a couple of years, I ended up in a company in Hollywood, uh, handling all the physical distribution of uh, syndication movie prints and television prints for all the major studios. And I finally realized that both the distribution companies and the studios had one major problem. The marketing department would sell a title and they couldn't deliver it. And they couldn't deliver it very simply because the master had deteriorated and they had no backup. And that's where I got the idea of what are we doing to preserve this wonderful art form of the 20th century? And that's where I got into it. And I realized that there's both a financial and a cultural need to preserve this art form. So I became an archivist in Paramount Pictures, eventually becoming, as you mentioned, president of EMEA. And then I formed my own consulting and project management firm for media preservation and uh, became and still am what I would call a very passionate preservationist. Great. So, uh, yeah, you have already sort of, you know, uh, given hand, you know, why preservation is important. Uh, you know, we are living in third world here. Uh, so third world, you know, realized very late uh, that, you know, preservation is really important. So they used to think, you know, the preservation is basically the first world concept. So especially in this part of the world, you know, this preservation concept came very late. So can you further elaborate on, you know, why, uh, why, why preservation is important actually for the whole world? Yes. All of the items that I mentioned, there are art forms. And an art form describes a, a place, a, a time, a theme of history. International peoples, people all over the world learn of other cultures and places through these art forms. So preserving them for future generations is really a solemn obligation. We can't judge today what someone would be interested in, say, in 25 years from now. And that's why our Library of Congress maintains a 25-year threshold for nominees for their national registry. And that's also why neither the archivist nor the preservationist should decide what gets saved. All of it at this point needs to go through the screen of longer time periods to determine the ultimate need. And that's why in Moving Image, we embraced film because it had a 125 year proven lifespan. 
We're worried about digital systems because they have no guaranteed long-term access. And preservation without access is just senseless. True, true that. Uh, Mr. Shepard, can you please compare you know, media preservation with the high intrinsic value artifacts, how these two things are different? Yeah, uh, and I've worked on both sides, both in uh, media and uh, with museums on what we call high intrinsic value artifacts. I would say the conservation technologies and the needs could be different, but the cultural and financial requirements are the same. We have to save all that for future generations to study and to learn from those art forms. Museum collections of art and manuscripts, costumes, historical artifacts, as well as moving image and recorded sound, they're all the basis for future historical studies. Okay, okay. Do you remember, you know, any any incidents, you know, where you, you faced yourself challenges and issues, you know, while preservation, uh, while doing the preservation of the media or high intrinsic value artifacts, any issue challenges, very, any incidents, you know, where you, you felt difficulty uh, in preserving the artifacts or the media preservation? Um, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that, really. Um, okay. It, there, to me, there was there was a natural bridge. I started off doing uh, media preservation, and then I was approached by a uh, religious group that had a uh, need for building proper storage facilities for a film collection, but they also had a tremendous amount of what I would call museum artifacts. Uh, the religious group is called the Self-Realization Fellowship, which I think started in India. Anyhow, what was interesting to me was that the uh, the guru who headed it in the United States was an avid badminton fa fan. And after he passed away, they kept all of his personal objects. Um, I was trying to figure out how to preserve some of those objects. For example, the badminton set. Well, the racket was easy. It was made of wood and cat gut and a leather handle. All right, so you can come up with temperature and humidity settings for those. But the shuttlecock, that really became a problem. We couldn't figure out how the feathers were glued into the cork. So we did a little bit of research and I ended up speaking with the vice president of development of Wilson Sporting Goods, arguably at that time, uh, the world's largest manufacturer of badminton shuttlecocks. And I explained what I was looking for. And he said, sir, I don't understand why you're going to all this trouble. The new ones only cost a dollar and 25 cents a piece. That obviously was a man that did not understand preservation. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, very well answered. In fact, uh, and uh, Mr. Shepter, you are the you know co-author of this you know very popular and very important uh, document of you know Academy's uh, project of this digital dilemma. You co-authored. You know, you are the co-author of this publication, which is a really, very very important document in the field of preservation and archive. So, how did this, this project uh, come about, actually? Um, it originated with the Science and Technology Council of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. In um, 2005, they recognized the coming onslaught of digital systems, but they were missing a very, very important goal. You see, digital technology really enhanced special effects possibilities. It uh, created a new type of distribution, including today's streaming, and supposedly was a cost saver. Responding to a rather sudden awareness in the industry, the Academy's Council began to look into this issue of guaranteed long-term preservation of digital materials. And I call it preservation of digital materials because there is no such thing as digital preservation. Anyhow, we hosted a summit. We brought in the chief technology officers from the studios, the uh, head uh, people from all of the major archives. And it was probably the first time that those two disciplines really had one-on-one -on -one conversations. We all realize that the lack of guaranteed access and the short life of digital file formats would greatly impact the whole idea of preservation. And as I said, preservation without access was meaningless. So the attendees at that summit basically put the monkey on the back, the shoulders of the Academy, which is a, uh, the Academy is neutral, nonpartisan organization. It has no ax to grind. So we were tasked at studying the issues. And the first thing we decided to do was to study what other industries and businesses, government, science, medical entities, what were they doing about this issue? Uh, that was a two year effort and that resulted in the publication of the Digital Dilemma in 2007. Since then, I think over 10,000 copies have been distributed globally. It's been translated into several languages, including Marathi 
and uh, Hindi is on, ongoing now under the sponsorship of the National Film Archive of India. And uh, it is downloaded continually almost on a daily basis. It reported on a very large range of organizational practices. And it analyzed the real costs of digital versus analog in production and storage. And uh, that's where we came up with the idea of dilemma. Dilemma means it's defined as having two possibilities, neither of which is alone satisfactory. So the results of the publication obviously set off a storm with a lot of denials, a lot of protests. Um, we uh, were called Chicken Little, <laughs> claiming the sky was falling. Our uh, academy president had uh, copies of the digital dilemma delivered to each studio head and other major industry executives over a weekend. And on Monday morning, the phone started ringing and it just didn't stop. We just referred those people who objected to our findings to the math of the storage costs and the actual quotes from the organizations we interviewed. And they all reported having the same issue with no solution. It was a digital dilemma. Good for techno technological reasons, but really failing in long-term guaranteed access or preservation. The digital dilemma too, that came about in a conversation between the Library of Congress and our managing director of the Science and Technology Council, my co-author, Andy Maltz. The library thought there was much more to the story from this, the viewpoint of independent filmmakers. And we eventually included documentarians in the subsection of that group. Uh, they were concerned about the smaller nonprofit archives that didn't have the resources of the major institutions. So we did Digital Dilemma 2. We revisited some of the first organizations that we interviewed to see if there was any progress. And we published reports in 2012. That's the story of Digital Dilemma. So I think this is fascinating stories of Digital Dilemma. And I'm sure this document is going to benefit in a lot of future preservationists and the archivists. Uh, so, any predictions as to what will happen in future technologically? Well, first of all, I think we ought to look at what happened since the report, because that kind of sets the basis for where the future is. Um, after, after the first Digital Dilemma was uh, published, Andy Maltz and I just traveled the world under the Academy's auspices. We appeared at film festivals. Uh, we addressed emerging and professional filmmakers and film schools and industry organizations, all to outline these issues. The main point was to make everyone aware that it was a dilemma and to stress that we were not luddites, but that any system that was going to replace the chemical optical film system should at least have the same benefits and hopefully a lot more. We wanted to make people aware of what the commitment to digital technologies really implied, the good and the bad. We found that everyone, all the organizations that we interviewed, had the same problems. That was problems with the concept of digital preservation, of uh, the preservation of digital materials, rather. And most importantly, no one had a long-term solution that wasn't really expensive in terms of significant capital investment and operational expense. And again, on Digital Dilemma 2, there are thousands of downloads, more language translations, and Andy and I continue to continued our outreach efforts trying to bring that message to people who were getting into digital technology. Yeah, I think. But now you asked about the future. Yes, so, yes. So, what kind of future positions will there be for the people you know who want to enter into this field? Well, first of all, let's let's establish a few things. Digital technology, as image capture and sound, and even in distribution, is here to stay. It's going to be here. In terms of long-term guaranteed access, the problem has not been solved. We have two basic issues. One is the medium of storage. And the other one, the continuing obsolescence of file formats. I think the storage medium is easier to address. And most organizations today, for example, use LTO tapes. And its problem is that they have a very short backward compatibility. If you're using generation seven or eight, for example, you can only go back two generations. So if you have stored on generation four or five or earlier, you have no access. The file formats change regularly. And again, unless you transfer to a new one, you lose all of your information. One answer, which many follow, and it is expensive from a labor and cost basis, is to migrate every couple of years. Now, for major library owners, that becomes geometrically expensive. 
because as you add to the legacy collection from your first year with all the new production in each year and every four to five years you have to migrate, it becomes very, very expensive. And for the smaller copyright holders, those without resources, that's it's just an unstarter. They don't have the financial resources to even consider migration. Uh, interesting to note that the International Storage Association in its own study concluded that migration as a long-term solution just wouldn't work. So what that means is that a large part of our creative content will be lost, just like a lot of the film during the nitrate age. But I think the question really is what's on the horizon? So I'd like to share with you two areas that I'm researching and pursuing. And the first is to return or rescan the digital master back as an optical image and deposit it on preservation film base. This would then return us to the 125 year known life of images on film base. But the scanning technology at this point has to be expanded to correctly interpret all the contrast and other parameters of good film image from the digital signal. And that's ongoing and it hasn't happened yet. The second area of interest is DNA. Uh, in theory, we could use the four designations of the DNA code to be the registrar of visual and audio information deposited on a DNA strand. That really offers a long, long life. Work in progress right now at IBM and the University of Washington, among other sites, has proven the theory of both encoding and retrieving the code. However, until it can be scaled up considerably, the cost is just too high. But like all breaking technologies, time will tell. The premise, I think, is very exciting. And of course, the Academy's ACES system will establish standards, as it has already with SMPTE, to possibly make some inroads into the file format problem. They have standardized the information on color access across various platforms, and that could be extremely helpful for us. But ultimately, as I've said before, we have to do away with the technological obsolescence that the vendors maintain they must have for survival. When I am on a panel with a vendor and they claim that they have to have the secret sauce code that's reproduced every year or two, I question them on the following basis. In our industry, we have had many what I would call open source type of backgrounds for people to work on. 35 millimeter film, of course, 16 millimeter film, quarter inch audio tape, um, the original DVD, these were all open source. Anyone could use them. There was no secret sauce. And a lot of companies and a lot of people made a lot of money on those. So why can't we do that with file format? The point is that we have to get back to the main and important consideration, which is the guaranteed long-term preservation of this very important art form. Do that, do that. So uh, can you sort of, you know, uh, enlist, you know, some future position which will be there for the people who enter into this field, like uh, beside preservationists and archivists, you know, what kind of, you know, lower roles people can have the only technical positions and what kind of background they require actually to go into the field? Yeah, many students ask about that. And I have to say that today's answer is a lot different from what the past answer would be. Right. Um, we used to archive and preserve just the completed master in moving image. And now the technology requires that we house even temporarily many, many of the intermediate records. And frankly, it goes beyond media. Let me give you two examples. Um, Downton Abbey and Game of Thrones, both highly rated fan favorite, well-watched telecasts. But now Downton Abbey is doing what we call pop-up performances all over England and perhaps already in Europe. So that means that the props, the costumes, the scripts, all the necessary paraphernalia needed to reproduce these smaller versions of the drama, they'll have to be cataloged, they'll have to be stored, they'll have to be repaired, and they'll have to be tracked into distribution. And the same thing will apply to Game of Thrones, which uh, anyone who's watched the show knows amassed a huge amount of weapons and costumes and battlements, so you get the picture. So many skilled people will be needed to fill these after distribution roles. Conservators and archivists will find many, many more opportunities than what they find today just in vaults. Right, right, right. Great. So, uh, uh, Mr. Mead, uh, I, I, I know that you have been working on this, you know, uh, new archive project of National Film Archive of uh, India, NFI Pune. So, can you please uh, tell us about that? Uh, yeah, thanks for the plug. I'd be happy to. 
Uh, can, can I just go back for a moment, though, to uh, because I think this is important for your audience. Um, yeah. It's the kind of background skills that they would need to go into these right. new areas. Because I think that's important for the some of the people in the right. audience, particularly emerging right. filmmakers. Right. I, th I think many of the needed skills that will be the, for, for the future will surpass the library and the film technology backgrounds and move into computer science. But basic archival and conservation skills, in my opinion, will always be in demand. I think the entire area is opening up with more and different preservation needs. And unlike film technology, where we learn from film laboratory experts, the new archival world will need its own set of backgrounds and experience. Uh, as I said, computer capability will be mandatory, and so will certain digital technology applications. Um, the various forms of media distribution will require new knowledge in many cases. And uh, as an example, I have to take Netflix, a, a, you know, a great streaming company. They're developing a common standard of post-production deliverables worldwide. So their people will only deal with one standard worldwide. And how much easier will that be than today's confusing array of all the different standards, which frankly really aren't standards? So I think there'll be a tremendous need for knowledgeable people to train the next generation of archivists and conservators and preservationists. But one question I have is, with all the dynamic changes in technology, who's going to train the trainers? That's a question I think our universities have to address. Okay, so let's talk about the NFAI project. Very dear to my <laughs> being at the moment. Um, I first encountered NFAI, the National Film Archive of India, many years ago. I was the chief judge at the Pune International Film Festival, and I was uh, thrilled to find that the archive had the original film of Gandhi and Nehru in their collection. I was not thrilled to find that the local electric company shut them down every day for three to four hours. And as I'm sure most of the people in the audience know, if you cut off uh, environmental standards of uh, HVAC for Every day you have a yo-yo effect, which is very, very detrimental to film. Anyhow, a few years later, I was delivering a talk on the digital dilemma at the Goa International Film Festival, which was, I think, where you and I first met. Yes. And I met a minister who at that time was in charge of government institutions such as the archive. And he was very interested in my thoughts on media preservation, flattering, by the way. And we met at the NFAI booth exhibit, which was part of the film festival. So about three years ago, the government actually gave the go-ahead for an evaluation of the current NFAI facilities. And I was hired to do that evaluation, bringing in other experts as needed. Last year, they named an architect firm, Environs, to lay out the campus for the new archive. And I was brought on again as the so-called archival expert. And before this Chinese virus panic hit, our team had started to develop the plans for the NFAI's archive of the future, which is going to house its iconic collection. That's very, very important for India's national heritage. And frankly, I'm honored to be part of that effort. The archive of the future, as we call it, will encompass the latest technologies in HVAC environment, security, fire suppression, storage systems, and editing reproduction workspace, as well as a lot of public areas for exhibition and research areas for scripts and posters and film, of course, and all part of their great collection. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful project, and I think it'll be the hallmark of archiving of moving image and recorded sound media for the world. At least I'm that's sure. I'm sure <laughs> it will be taken to the next level now. Uh, so uh, I have another question uh, to you, Mr. Chapter. The term preservationist suggests becoming, you know, being concerned with the past. So what about future, actually? That's a very thoughtful question. So. Looking back at my work in archival design and operation at Paramount Pictures and other major Hollywood studios, including my latest archive at Disney, Library of Congress, National Audiovisual Conservation Center, various museums, I would say that my role was to assure the long-term access and preservation of their collections of very, very important creations. I think the future needs will build on this type of knowledge base. But we need to discover what's needed to either reproduce and distribute or to enhance singular versions. Sculptures, for example, will last centuries materially. But other arts and artifacts and creative content are going to need new systems of preservation and archiving storage to assure 
assure the availability for future generations. I think that scientific knowledge from other disciplines will eventually apply to the world of materials preservation. And in some cases, hopefully many cases, those scientists will need the collaboration and the knowledge of today's end custodians, the archivists, the conservators, and the preservationists, all to create the new systems. I think it's going to be challenging, and I think it's going to be rewarding. True that. True that. How will decision be made as to you know what to keep? I think that's a, a decision I would call a two-way street. Um, obviously, we have to keep the master elements, which allow us to create distribution copies in the future. I'm talking again about moving image recorded sound. And hopefully, we will have a technology that allows that with guaranteed long-term access. The second issue is what we don't keep. And that is not a decision for the archivist or the preservationist. I don't think anyone can really decide what scholars or researchers or even the general public will find interesting two or more generations from now. But remember, I mentioned that our Library of Congress uses a 25-year mark to consider entries into the National Registry. They consider that amount of time necessary to judge in the past, without the blinders of current marketing, what is really important for culture. I think in many cases, holders of large libraries of creative content will find the current cost of migration is not supported by the financial possibilities of a title and just not do anything more to keep it reserved. And um, we're going to lose it. And that's the sad part. In moving image, the actual increased costs, and they are actual, of digital production and post-production and storage and migration, I think it's going to result in much material being lost just by not being preserved. And that's factual. Any final thoughts for our audience? Yeah, if there's one special thought I'd like to leave with this audience, it's I think we have an obligation to preserve the heritage of moving image and recorded sound, just like we do for fine art and writing and music. Cinema is a 20th century art form. Scholars and researchers, film buffs, they're going to ask why we do why we didn't do a better job of preserving our film collections. You know, between 1920 and 1930 in the United States, we made over 6,600 films, and yet only 10 to 15 percent survive today. To me, this would be the equivalent of a famous painter doing his creation with disappearing paints. It would be a great loss. I think time is our greatest enemy, and we must solve the digital dilemma. True that. True that. Yeah. It's, uh, Mr. Schefter, I think we will take some audience question now because it's already 33 minutes past now. So we'll quickly take you know a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, they are typing on our Facebook Live uh, show. So first uh, comment comes from the uh, Mr. Ashwin Gambir. He says, you know, very warm welcome to Honorable Mr. Schefter on this platform. Thank you so much for joining us. So he thank you actually. And uh, then we have a question. Uh, then we have a comment. Comment from the Mr. Ojwal Nirgutkar also. He said, "Nice to see Milt live on FB." He he said, "Thanks to you." I'm sorry. Well, I, I'm sure my audio is not good. I didn't hear it. Is that a question? <laughs> no, these are just appreciate appreciation. You know, comments uh, from the audience first. Uh, Mr. Ojwal Nirgutkar. He says, "Nice to see Milt live on FB." He thank you for joining you know, live on the Facebook today. My pleasure, believe me. Thank you. So we have, you know, uh, this question uh, from Ashwin. He says, uh, preservation is important part in archive of cinema culture, but found Indian industry thing and talk, uh, but not executing the idea of opening any institute or specific training on the art of preservation for youngsters. How you see the story of India and world? He, he specifically said there, there is no, you know, Concentrated effort for preservation and the archive purpose. There is there are no courses in the university. There is no formal training for the future. So how do you look at this problem? You know, in India as a worldwide. Um, that's a very good question. We uh, talked earlier about training the trainers. Um, I know that the film institute that I visited there has some excellent uh, teachers. Uh, when I talked to the director there a couple of years ago, uh, he was very interested in knowing. Um, 
what the subjects of preservation would be. But in truth, I don't think that that's just an, an issue with India. I think it's a worldwide issue. When I look at the programs that the uh, institutions here in the United States and the ones in England that I'm familiar with are doing, uh, they are quite behind the time in terms of addressing the digital technologies. And I think the reason there is because there's a dividing line between the knowledge that we used to get from the film laboratory technicians, people who worked in film labs and retired and passed on that information, and this confluence of disciplines which is necessary in the new digital world. Um, I, th I think you need a combination of not only library science, but computer science, as well as preservation, archival science, to come together to create the, uh, the people who are going to be in charge of this art form in, in the future. I don't think that has been addressed yet, and it was uh, our hope, Andy Maltz and I, as we talked to emerging filmmakers and film schools, that this would be an issue that would be addressed. I can't honestly say it has been, but I think in the future, it has to be. It has to be. Because, you know, if you look at the global scenario now, there are, you know, film studies courses, there are film production courses, but you don't see, you know, many of the, you know, film preservation or the film archive courses. So there is no, you know, uh, very concentrated effort in the in this area actually. Especially in India, scene is, you know, very very bad because you 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 hardly have any film preservation or you know film archive course in, in any university or the college setup. But I think one thing you can look at is that the National Film Institute of India, NFAI. I think right. that they will be a a wonderful training for other people. In many archives around the world, the training is on the job training. Uh, people come in with not too much background experience because not too many can afford a master's degree at a university. And they're trained on the job. As I said in the past, this has been film technology, but now it has to go into these other areas. But that also means that we would bring in people with these other skills, people who uh, were in, con in computer science that may not wanna just do coding, but would find this a more interesting area. Obviously, the uh, the idea of library science was, is always important in terms of cataloging, but the technological aspects are what we have to train people in. And I think institutions like you will have in India and like currently exist in the United States and England and the Netherlands and Germany, there are some wonderful institutions that are doing good work in preservation and people will be trained through them on the job or through different conferences. To that. <laughs> happen very soon uh, uh, so luckily we have uh, mr prakash magdum you know director uh, uh, nfa pune on on facebook live he says hello me good to see you here hope hope to see you soon the archive is very fortunate to have him as a director he is truthfully a film scholar and very very knowledgeable and a pleasure to work with absolutely i think nfa do, is doing wonderful job and and they have preserved you know a lot of material of indian cinema there uh, now, Ujwal Nirbutkar has a question. Hi, Milt. What will be the situation on archiving activities worldwide post COVID 19 pandemic? Um, <laughs> Ujwal, I know you travel the world, so you may have better information than I do. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have had quite a, uh, an impact of COVID 19 um, on all industries, not just ours. I think the major thing that's come out of it, which is going to be, I think, a hallmark of this, is that people are learning to stream uh, in their homes. And this is going to have an impact on theaters. And you know, the real enjoyment of a motion picture to me is sitting with an audience in that darkened theater and having that shared emotional experience and reacting either with tears or laugh and sharing that, which you don't get in the house. Also, when I, and I'm part of the uh, American Society of Cinematographers, they spend so much time in framing that image and it is made to be seen on a large screen with perfect color and wonderful aspect ratios to create the emotion of that experience. And now that people are so used to watching at home on television sets, and if you look at most people's homes, the television sets are really not calibrated right, for, even for color. I think that's gonna change dramatically. But let us face it, it is commercial enterprise and the people who make this creative content have to go where the revenue is going to come from. If that's going to be screening and television, that's where it will be. Um, there's an interesting point on that. You know, preservation, at least in our country, really started 
because of distribution. Um, many times, films were divided into classes. You had the A major title, you had the B title, which circulated, and then they threw them away, so on and so forth. And when television came around in the mid-50s, the um, copyright owners, the studios, realized that they could sell their B pictures uh, to television for syndication uh, for you know a lot of money. The problem was, of course, they had to make sure they could deliver. So at that particular point, they would take the money to make a set of separations or an interpositive so they could deliver that particular title. That's how preservation really came around. It was paid for. And if streaming is going to be the method of distribution, then some of that revenue has to come back to the archiving and preservation of that media because it will be streamed for years and years and years. So COVID-19, I think, has changed maybe our viewing patterns. I'm not sure it's for the best, but I'm sure it has changed. I'm sure everyone <laughs> is well answered. Uh, so we have a comment from Sanish Kambavi. He says, very informative talk by Mr. Mill Shafter. Thanks. He says, thanks to you. Thank you, sir. And then we have another question from Mr. C.G. Srigua. He's a Pune Film Institute graduate and a very senior editor and, and filmmaker as well. He says, it is said that optical format is better than the digital format for the conservation and storage of data as the data cannot be affected by virus and corruption. In today's situation with most of the optical film manufacturers and processing centers closing their shops, what is your opinion on using optical medium for the storage and preservation of the data? Um, as I mentioned, uh, I, obviously I'm in favor of it. I think it is better. Uh, for one thing, you can see what you have. In digital, we make sometimes four copies just to make sure that we're covered because we don't know what we have. And also, uh, there, <laughs> it's a wonderful scenario, which I'm sure was filed as a plot with the Writers Guild, about an uh, international conflict where a uh, satellite sent out magnetic signals and destroyed everything that was recorded magnetically and so much for digital signals. <laughs> but realistically, um, I'm much in favor of that, and uh, I know that uh, Kodak continues to manufacture preservation stocks and is very interested in getting back to that. Uh, as preservationists, we feel it's a better answer. I think realistically, though, we're going to have to solve the problem of scanning. That's where the issue is, to make sure that we can pick up what I won't say has been lost in digital, but what was not present in film. Uh, we have to get back out of that information and deposit that on film so that when we go to reproduce it, we have an excellent image. True, that I think this question is also well answered. Uh, Mr. Milk, we have another question from Mr. Umar Azmi. He said, uh, first off, I would like to start by saying that it's quite a pleasure seeing you here, sir. I know this is not the relevant to talk, but I don't know if you have heard this from someone else, but you look a lot like uh, Randy Blythe from the band Lamb of God. So he's... he's <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll accept so, that as a compliment. <laughs> I, 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 I have not heard that. <laughs> so he, he has a question. In fact, he says that coming to the question, I'll again uh, drift a little from films, but looking at it uh, from a preservationist point of view, a lot of games of from earlier console are being remade for the you know current generation consoles. So what's your view on the value of original product as a preservationist and archivist? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> well, from a practical standpoint, you have to maintain the original record because in many of the cases, uh, they're going to be using elements of that in the newer versions. Um, from a cultural standpoint, I really can't answer that. I don't know what the value is. Uh, you know, 25 years from now, someone will say, yeah, that... Uh, game that we played with uh, I'd like to see again. Financially, obviously, that makes sense. Um, interesting anecdote at that point, one of the first filmmakers to embrace digital was George Lucas. Uh, Mr. Lucas spent a lot of money on special effects in the earlier versions of uh, Star Wars, and uh, he had hoped to use those in future productions to amortize the cost. And I remember talking to one of his technicians who said when they found out that that information could not be accessed again, they couldn't figure out who was going to be the one to tell George. So yeah. there, there are definitely uh, <laughs> there are a lot of issues with the digital, obviously. But in terms of what the final product is, um, again, it becomes both a cultural and a financial decision. 
True. I am sure Rohan, your question is well answered. Uh, so we have another question uh, from Mr. Saurabh Goyal. He says, uh, "Hi, Milt. You said digital is here to stay, and that is uh, it's inevitable. Uh, but what about film photochemical material? So going forward, do you suggest you know fusing photochemical into digital as a moral way of filming in future to keep the aesthetics of photochemical as well as the entry level economic economy and ease of uh, digital?" Yes, I, I I I agree with that definitely. Um, as I said, I think there are very very valuable aspects to the digital technology, particularly in the area of special effects and in distribution. It's in preservation that we have the problem, and uh, I think going back to the film optical system right now, if they can solve the problem of scanning, would be a viable alternative. I mean, let's be realistic: film was not the perfect medium. Uh, the original negative was very fragile. It scratched easy. Uh, we had many problems with it. But again, once it was preserved in whatever condition it was in at the point of preservation, you had a 125-year life. That's proven. And so far, with digital, if you're considering migration, your life is four to five years and expensive. Great. I think with this question, we come to the end of this session now. And it's been such a you know wonderful session, such a fruitful session for the future generation preservationists. I'm, I'm sure you know they, they are going to keep this knowledge with themselves, and it is going to help them in you know for for future preservation and the archival project. I thank you so much, Mr. Mil Shetra, for joining us today. It's it, it's been such an honor and privilege to have you on the show today. And thank you again, and thank you very much for your questioning, and thank you for the audience for your questions as well. I hope that we all follow that. Uh, idea of the necessity for the preservation of this art form. I'm sure we do. Thank you so much, Mr. Shil Janning, joining us today. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll be back again, you know, uh, day after tomorrow at 11.30 uh, a.m. Uh, with another uh, media personality. So till then, please uh, uh, just uh, keep following our FB page. Uh, we'll be informing you tomorrow about the you know next personality will be joining us uh, day after tomorrow till then please take care goodbye good day thank you so much